So hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for the last session of the day. My name is Lisa Gillis. I am part of the Hypothesis team, and I'm really excited to have you all with us today. There's been some really great sessions, and I have no doubt um, that we're, we'll be ending with another really great session today um, with Dr. Jennifer Young and LJ Varghese, who are here to run our session on uh, run the session, social annotations, role in building and maintaining a community of practice. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout um, the session, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and Jennifer and LJ will be able to answer them um, throughout the session. I will hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you thank so much. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, go ahead, LJ. <laughs> I was just saying thank you. Um, so welcome everybody to the webinar today, and thank you for taking time out of your Wednesday afternoon to join us, some of you Wednesday morning. My name is Jennifer Young. I'm an adjunct instructor with the University of Alaska Fairbanks Community and Technical College, and I've been teaching with them for um, almost 10 years now. And I also work in the UAF Center for Teaching and Learning slash eCampus department. So we kind of work on piloting a lot of these new technologies. And I was really happy to take part in joining the hypothesis trend. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to LJ for an introduction. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I am LJ Varghese. I use they, them pronouns. I am an instructional designer at the UAF Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, I've been there for uh, just a couple years now, and I also have a background in librarianship. And so um, social annotation is something that um, I have used previously in courses that I've taught in um, and a tool that we share with a lot of the faculty that come to us for consultations um, or guidance. And so just to give you an idea of what um, we'll be talking about today, we'll start with just kind of a general brief overview, defining communities of practice for those that are unfamiliar with the concept. Um, and then Jennifer will be talking about specific examples and, and what building a community of practice looks like with social annotation. Um, and we will also be talking about um, things that you can implement to foster that engagement. So um, to start us off, um, so communities of practice are formed by people who engage in a process of collective learning in a shared domain of human endeavor. Um, this is a concept that was coined by Etienne Wenger and Jean Lave in the early 1990s, and they started off by studying um, apprenticeships and um, looking at how apprentices who engage in trade um, learn that trade and what that model of learning looks like. And they said, okay, um, you know, this is true for people who are sort of learning like physical hands-on skills. Is this something that we can apply to um, more like cognitive or abstract types of learning? And they found that they could. And so um, they expanded it into this idea of cognitive apprenticeship. And fundamentally, what it means is um, that these are social learning systems, that knowledge is co-created, it is a collaborative experience, um, and that it also has to be contextualized, that you it's it's harder to learn when you are siloed or sort of existing in a vacuum, that it has to, um, whatever you're learning about has to happen within the context of sort of the real world and has to be happening with other people. So um, that social aspect is a really, really key part. Um, and there are three sort of uh, defining features of a community of practice. The domain, which is sort of the what, um, and that is the shared learning needs. So that is the area of interest, study, or work. So you know, these communities of practice can pop up outside of the classroom. We often see them in like organizations, um, you know, hobbyists and things like that. The community is the who. Um, and this is really important because um, shared activities are what create that community. So that collective learning, that group identity. Um, but really important is unless they interact and learn together, it's not a community of practice. So that interaction is, is really key. 
Um, and then finally, the practice. And so that's that's the how. So what are they doing to interact? How are they engaging with each other? What are they producing um, within this community of practice? Um, and what's also really important to know is that um, identity and practice are not separated. So what um, these practitioners do sort of outside of the community of practice and who they are informs how they participate in this community of practice. And that relationship sort of goes both ways. So that's something um, to consider. Okay, and a, a quick caveat. Um, so there's this quote, um, no community can be can fully design the learning of another. And at the same time, no community can fully design its own learning. Um, and this is just to say that uh, communities of practice can't sort of be willed, declared, structured, or, you know, in the case of classrooms, assigned into existence. Um, they have to happen at least somewhat organically because the members have to be actively involved in the co-creation of the learning experience, right? That's sort of the core part of a community of practice. And so um, it's important to note that like social annotation and using social annotation in your classroom won't create a community of practice automatically. There are things that you can do with social annotation, right? It's one tool that can encourage the formation of a community of practice. Um, and I think that it's particularly useful and often more effective than other sort of more traditional um, learning activities might. Um, but just to say that, you know, just using social annotation in the classroom will not automatically create that community of practice. Okay. Jennifer, I'll pass it over to you to talk about um, what it looks like when you use when you use social annotation in your class and the impact of that. Thank you, LJ. Um, so I am currently teaching four different classes that I'm utilizing uh, social annotation through hypothesis in, and that ranges from income tax to employment and business law, um, and also an investing class. So I was able to extrapolate kind a lot of analytical data based on usage in those four classes over the last probably two years, and. The first thing that I noticed, uh, regular and substantive interaction is kind of a buzzword at a lot of our different universities right now, otherwise termed as RSI. But the regular interaction between the instructors and students increased 1400 to 2100%, which is just quite impressive. Um, and it really helps us when we're looking at accreditation for those courses, especially when it comes to military communities. The second thing that we noticed or that I noticed in those classes was that the average student posted almost 40 times more than they did on traditional discussion board formats. In many classes, uh, instructors will have discussion boards for maybe the introductory assignment and then maybe one per chapter, sometimes even less. And those are very uh, strictly formatted interactions where students are, are told to respond to one particular quote and then build off of that information. But the freedom that social annotation provides, I think, allows students to be a little bit more creative and engage in other ways than those uh, strict discussion board formats allow. The third thing that we noticed was failure rates decreased 5 to 33%. If you've got a class of 8 to 15, or if you've got a class of 30 to 60, that makes a big difference. You're talking about quite improved student success rates, and the students are seeing that they are understanding the material. They have more avenues for uh, gaining a better understanding and grasp of the material, and they're utilizing that. Anecdotally, I've also seen a lot more, a lot less withdrawals or um, instructor withdrawals. So the students are engaged from the very beginning. And four to 24% of students increase their course grades. So again, you're seeing students go from an F or a withdrawal to A's and B's, which is again, pretty impressive when you're talking about just a change over one semester with just a simple integration of this 
annotation tool. Great. Um, and so kind of the, oh, go ahead, Jennifer, sorry. No, you're good. Go ahead, LJ, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that one of the things to note, again, is that, you know, social annotation is not um, like a miracle cure, right? And it also, it very much depends on how you use it. And that's something that we will be um, looking at later in this presentation. Um, but I just I think it's really important, um, you know, to be realistic when thinking about um, how we're using these tools specifically and that, you know, the tool in and of itself is not necessarily going to um, fix sort of all the problems that that or challenges that we see with student engagement and participation. That's great feedback. Thank you, LJ. Um, this slide is just takeaways. So it's a, a verbal overview of what we discussed in the previous one with the data analytics. But student engagement is increasing exponentially. Student success in courses is improving. Students are engaged with instructors and fellow students, and students are reading the material and demonstrating and understanding. Uh, one of the biggest stumbling blocks or hurdles that I've noticed, not just in courses with my students, but courses across the campus is textbooks are extremely expensive and students were either not buying them or they were renting them for short times and majority of them were not reading them. So when I do my courses, the course material is all social annotated. So they have to engage with it. They have to show that they're reading it. The annotations have to be related to the content and demonstrate that they are understanding or building or questioning. And those are really important things that have engaged them. So we know that they are doing more potentially than they were before. Okay. So thinking about um, how does social annotation produce these results or at least um, encourage those results. Um, one of the important things to know is that supporting engagement is supporting the formation of communities of practice, right? That engagement piece is really key. Um, and it's not just, you know, are our students posting and engaging sort of with the material, but are they engaging with each other? Like how, again, it's that co-creation of knowledge and learning experiences. And so I think social annotation um, creates really unique opportunities for engagement, um, especially if your course is online and asynchronous. Um, it becomes much easier to sort of replicate the kind of discourse you would see potentially in like an in-person course um, where students are having like a, a real-time conversation. Um, and the thing that is great about social annotation is that, you know, for students who maybe need to take a little bit more time to process things, to go over them more than once, um, they still have that opportunity to engage because it's because it's asynchronous. And so it's kind of like at their pace. Um, it's also, you know, one of the really cool things about hypothesis is that um, you can annotate more than just text, right? So you have options, particularly for visual content. Um, and the UI emphasizes that engaging with materials, knowledge production, and learning, right? It really emphasizes that collaborative experience. Um, so, you know, being able to thread comments, you know, tagging mentions, um, you know, the upvotes and things like that are all different ways. And one sort of mimic um, social media platforms and how we engage on there, which um, particularly for for younger students, sort of the millennial Gen Z students, um, makes it a little bit, can make it a little bit more intuitive, not always. Um, and, you know, those are not always our students. Um, but I think it does make it really easy to see the way in which learning is a thing that happens collectively. And then the text or whatever you're annotating um, becomes a learning artifact, right? It becomes an object of study sort of within itself because now you have not just the original sort of source material, 
but um, you know, your peers' reflections and comments um, and additions to that. And so it sort of becomes this, this living thing, um, which is really great for communities of practice. And so there are some sort of characteristic activities that happen um, within communities of practice. Um, these include problem solving, requests for information, seeking experience, um, reusing assets or sort of resource sharing. Uh, coordination and synergy just mean it's very similar to like sort of collective problem solving or sort of pooling efforts and resources. Um, mapping knowledge and identifying gaps in knowledge. Um, discussing recent developments and sort of keeping up with um, trends and developments. Um, documentation projects. So when there's a process that happens over and over, coming together to create documentation for that. Um, and then sort of visits. Um, this is more relevant, I think, for um, sort of in-person communities of practice, but um, being able to go to other sites of activity and see what other groups are doing. Um, this is not an exhaustive list and, you know, social annotation can't necessarily um, facilitate all of these things, um, but we will be highlighting some particular examples um, from Jennifer's classes. Thank you, LJ. Um, so as we go through here, I'll kind of introduce the problem solving or the characteristic activities. This first one that we're going to look at as problem solving. Uh, but in all of these, if you look on the left side, you're going to see a highlight and the highlight is what was annotated in the text. So the first one, example two, is an example problem. And the second one is kitty tax. And these are from courses that I have taught, and these particular ones are both from the income tax course, which seems quite suited to the problem solving activity. In the first one, the student annotated the problem in the chapter. She provided an explanation of how to solve it based on information that she learned um, in her own experiences in another position in another course. So that was really nice to see that. If you were not using the social annotation tool and the students were reading this text individually I, or not reading it at all, um, they wouldn't have had that opportunity to share the knowledge immediately as it was triggered by reading the content. So you're reading something, you see how it relates to your real world experience, you're sharing that with other students, which I find um, wonderful. The second student was just really struggling with the concept of how kitty tax is calculated. And she said, hey, I've been working on the homework. Can anyone help me with this? And almost immediately, another student chimed in and helped her solve that problem. And in these cases, I'm seeing that they are getting almost instant feedback in many cases from their peers. So they're learning and they're also not having to wait for a response for an instructor who might not be online 24 seven waiting for those questions to come in. But both of them show that students are gaining an understanding of the content. They're asking questions and they're answering questions, which is something that I'd want to see in any of the courses that I'm working on. The next one we're going to look at is requests for information. And I think this kind of ties closely into the previous one that we looked at for the activities. In this one, um, both of these examples are requests for information from students that expand on the content in the chapter. So they read something they wanted to learn a little bit more. And they may or may not have decided to do the research their own, or they thought somebody else might have that information and be able to share that without taking that time. So they're engaging, they're interested, they want to know more. But um, what I find here is when you're doing a discussion board concept versus social annotation, again, that framework, that stringent framework would have probably not allowed this type of response and interaction with others on a completely different topic. So they're expanding um, that interaction with each other and their experiences and knowledge base. All right, 
The next one, Seeking Experience, we address the um, Title IX Civil Rights Act of 1964, and they just had some other questions. So they highlighted items of interest in the text and asked for real world experiences. Have you dealt with these things? How did you handle them? What are your thoughts? They're seeking an expanded understanding, but they're also feeling safe enough to interact with others in the class to say, hey, what do you think about this? And as people are responding and asking that, to me, that's a very personal experiences, personal opinions that if you hadn't formed a sense of community, even on the beginning level, that they probably would not have felt comfortable asking. Okay. So the next one we're gonna talk about is reusing asset examples. Um, in this one, the first example, somebody shared a, a link to an article, and then in the second one, they provided some information from their job. Students are seeking out additional resources. They're tying it into the content. They're supplementing and building on the content, um, but they're also providing pros and cons in their own opinion based on these. They're not just sharing it and leaving it there for somebody else to figure out why it was shared and why that individual thought it was important. But these particular examples stem from a prompt regarding finding an outside source that ties into the content and explaining how it supports it. So in order to gain those points for the social annotation, they had the option of choosing that prompt. And I think both of these examples did a really good job of following those guidelines and uh, providing extra resources and information for students. So in this discussing developments, both of these posts are related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it explains some of the reasons behind exclusions when the act was initially um, created and implemented, but also why there's been a number of court judgments based on the definition of dis disabilities due to just changes in how our world functions and how things have changed since its initial introduction uh, in 1989, which was quite a while ago. So you're seeing how they're looking up that case law, they're looking up the common law um, judgments, they're looking up when and how things were implemented and why. Uh, documentation project examples is something that we don't focus on quite often in my courses other than business law. This one came from um, income tax and it's an example that's in response to a create a question and associated answer prompt. Uh, for many of my courses, I'm using open educational resources and in one or two of them, I've created my own resources for students to use. So this is a way for them to build the course for future semester offerings. It allows them to kind of think through certain scenarios and add their own opinions in there. Um, but what you see in here is it documents the procedures for internal audit reporting systems. And this is something that is tested and um, discussed in the content material. So this is a second example of documentation project examples. It utilizes an outside resource to document how employees should handle harassment situations. And both of these examples, this one on this slide and the previous slide are independently created topics by the students um, that may or may not have occurred um, with the discussion format. Mapping knowledge and identifying gaps is the last characteristic activity that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, there's two examples here, and students in these examples are expanding on concepts that were introduced into the class where they felt that the content was maybe not as descriptive as it needed to be for their peers, uh, not robust enough, or they just have some personal knowledge that they felt would be helpful to others. And most of the knowledge in these two posts is gained from personal experience. So they're sharing parts of themselves with the other students. And as a class commences and students start interacting, there's always a little bit of hesitancy when you're using social interaction um, or annotation 
or discussion posts. And so the initial posts tend to be very face value. These are from later in the semester. So the semester has progressed a little bit. The students have gotten to know one another. They're a sense of community has formed, and so they're reaching out to others. They're feeling safe, safe about sharing personal details, and they're working with each other to increase the depth of their knowledge. Those are all wonderful things to see as an instructor. So I had mentioned um, some of the prompts in previous uh, characteristic activity discussions. And I use currently four main prompts, and I discussed with LJ as we were building this presentation that as time has gone on, I'm thinking more and more about how to reclassify them or change them to encourage even more um, community building and interaction and just quality content for the courses. But the first one is creating a question and associated answer based on the content. So as they're reading, if something um, stands out to them, if they have a scenario in mind because it happened in their personal life, they can create a question based on that scenario and then they provide an answer. So myself as the instructor could go through and utilize that in a future semester as an assignment or a quiz question or even um, a prompt in the social annotation for that particular module or chapter. Uh, the second is provide a considerate response to a question posed by the instructor. So I will often go through, um, especially in income tax, and I'll say, did you understand where this number came from? Um, why do you think that this is an important tax for individuals? How do you think that it should be changed? So if they respond to those prompts, then they can get their annotation points for that too. But this has to be a considerate considerate or considerable response. It can't just be, yes, I agree. Uh, those are things that we're trying to steer away from because they don't add any content or value in most cases. The third one is post a link to an article or a video that increases peer knowledge or helps to explain a concept. A lot of students um, take on this particular prompt and they'll post a video link, but they won't go further and explain how that relates to the content. Typically, I will follow up in those cases and say, hey, this is great that you shared this video. What in the video did you think related well to the content? Why is it important for the other people in the class to watch these things? Um, sometimes they're two minutes, sometimes they're 10 minutes. So let's figure out where the value is so that people can decide whether or not it's worth spending that time reviewing. Uh, the fourth one is post and or respond to student inquiries and or requests for help. And this is really important in the income tax course. If they're struggling with particular questions, somebody can respond and help. And it just cuts down the time that they're waiting for an answer in many cases. Um, this semester I have your annotations can fall under one of those four categories. But I think in the future, I'm going to say that you need to have one from each category just to diversify the way that they're looking at the material and how they're interacting with it. Yeah. Um, and another thing that I'd like to point out with sort of these categorizations is um, with social annotation, you can also like use hashtags um, so that you can kind of classify these things and also so that you can kind of see like all of um, you know the posts with a particular hashtag. So ones for help or questions in particular can be really great as an instructor. Um, another one is if you create a specific hashtag for um, when students are connecting different course content. So connecting like one reading to another or something like that. Um, it sort of allows you to create this um, knowledge map, which can be really cool. Um, and so these are four specific ways that um, Jennifer has been using in classrooms. And there are also sort of other things that you can do to ensure that your social annotation activities are successful. Um, modeling and practice can be really important for a lot of students. Um, you know, social annotation is new and unfamiliar. And so creating robust examples of like, this is the kind of, you know, comment that I want you to be making. Here are the specific things that I'm looking for. Um, and then having students annotate like an example text, right? Something that is fun or low stakes, just so that they can kind of 
become accustomed to the process of annotation. Um, and it's also, you know, kind of cool to see if how students decide to annotate your examples of annotations, right? So you can get a little bit meta with it. Um, Jennifer sort of mentioned this, the seeding and feedback. So adding your own comments and questions to encourage en engagement, right? Like having particular questions to prompt inquiry or reflection throughout um, the course content gives sort of an anchor point for students um, that can be helpful, particularly as they're sort of just starting out or to point to something that you really want them to dive into. Um, giving students agency. So offering multiple options or examples of types of posts um, and allowing them to make choices about how they engage with course materials. So, you know, the more options or examples you show, um, the better, because I think particularly for students who are new to social annotation, the possibilities of what you can comment um, or how you can contribute are sort of limited. Um, but also, you know, not necessarily requiring that students, you know, do five annotations per reading or um, course material, or they have to do, you know, two of each type of thing, but sort of just giving them general guidelines and allowing them to really direct how they're engaging with course materials within, within certain parameters, of course. Um, so I think that those are kind of three really um, big things that you can do to, to make sure that um, that, that uh, your social annotations are actually encouraging engagement and that they're not sort of just another discussion board. Um, and so that is the end of our presentation. We will be sharing these slides out. And so these references and resources um, will be available to you as well. Um, I guess if anyone has any questions, you can take them now. I do, there is one question um, that's been submitted by Miriam and I'm just looking in, into it for you, Miriam, to see if we have any resources around that and I can follow up. It's um, Her question was regarding the online version of Hypothesis because they don't have the LMS version. So I'm just clarifying that for you and we'll um, follow up after the presentation through email. Um, but is there anybody else that has any questions for LJ or Jennifer? Oh, it looks like Kevin um, Hunt had a question there. It says, one issue that has arisen in other sessions is that of grading annotations. How do you do it? Um, so as I mentioned in the presentation itself, this semester I'm using, um, you must, create four annotations, they must fall into one of those four categories. And um, it's a maximum of eight points for each of the annotation pro assignments. And if it falls into that criteria, I provide them with their full points. Um, it's actually a pretty easy way for students to gain points that help in the class and in their grade, but it's not enough that if they don't participate in the actual work, that it's gonna make a huge difference. Um, but that's what we're doing currently. If you've got any ideas of other ways to do it, um, <laughs> anyone online or LJ. Yeah, um, I think this is where sort of those examples and rubrics can be really helpful because you can say, you know, when I'm grading, um, you know, for example, if they're responding to a question, the thing that I'm looking for is how does this drive the conversation forward? And if you can answer that, right, if you're adding information, then I'll give you the points. Um, otherwise, you know, it'll be partial or no credit. Um, but I think that also sort of allowing this to be a sort of supplement and so not necessarily a, a major part of their grades is really important. Um, and I know that like I've had professors when I was in graduate school when they did this that particularly, you know, for graduate students specifically, it was sort of honor system based. And so we just submitted like, oh, I made, you know, these comments for this reading, these comments for this reading. Um, but I think that 
um, really rubrics and thinking about like, you know, asking sort of yourself, like what kinds of, um, what kinds of contributions am I looking for? Like what specific qualities? And so being able to do that. Um, how do you manage the marking of all these annotations? A very excellent related question. So, so, I mean, sometimes, you know, it might just be like in my graduate school classes, the honor system, um, having sort of a, um, a very simple rubric can be helpful. Um, and then I believe hypothesis, you can kind of see specific students annotations, correct, Jennifer? Uh, yes, I created groups for each of the classes, and so they can see everybody's. Um, but if you go into the gradebook specifically in Canvas and just click on that individual submission, you will see everything that they did. But you can also expand it to see how, like if they responded to somebody else or somebody responded to them, you can expand that information and see it. So I'll go in each student's um, grade after that annotation assignment is due um, and grade based on, on those particular parameters. Anybody else? Got a couple of minutes left. If not, then uh, let's see here. There might be something in the chat. Kevin, I just, I saw your, your two posts here and yes, responding and validating students' annotations um, definitely, I think, encourage them. And what I found is also in my instructor feedback, uh, the surveys at the end of the year, students have actually said, we were really, really happy with the level of engagement and how you were part of this class. So that was really nice to see. So they're enjoying the annotations. Um, the fact that they're filling out the surveys and then they're including that, I think, is pretty beneficial in supporting the use of them. There is another question here um, from Miriam, and, and I can let you guys answer it if you need me to answer it. Uh, let me know. How does Hypothesis deal with privacy as students can see each other's annotations? I think it's just asking about whether students can see each other's annotations. Yes. Um, they can see each other's annotations and what I'm currently utilizing uh, in my syllabus that's shared that if they want to have a, an anonymous moniker, then they can have that in there if they don't want it associated directly with them. Um, and I've had cases where students have been um, in protection status due to abuse situations, things like that, um, and they have chosen to use that option. But most of the time, if they're dealing with a privacy issue, they're not going to post something that would violate that privacy. There is also an option for students who want to use it as a self-study tool and not necessarily, they may want to take a note or remind themselves to come back to a piece of content without sharing it out so they can keep their own annotations um, for themselves so nobody can see it, the students or the professor. Um, and in some cases, if you want it only faculty to student, um, then you could set up groups of one if you really want it to uh, only have the annotations open to the faculty only. Obviously, though, you're losing the, the collaboration piece, but in certain specific assignment requirements, we have had faculty um, do that. Uh, how do you send the slides to us? Uh, I believe they're actually posted on the main website. Um, I'm not 100% sure how we're going to be sending those out, but I believe if they're not available on the website, they'll be included in the recording that we send out through email after the event. But I will check with uh, my marketing team on that and, and, and let you know, uh, Sholi. And Lisa, there's one more question about screen readers and hypothesis, which I'm not able to, to comment on. I don't see that one, sorry. Let's... It's at the bottom of the Q&A. Q&A, okay, I was looking at the chat. Um, this must come up on other panel, but how well does it work with screen readers? Um, 
currently it works with all of the other with all of the major screen readers i am an account manager at hypothesis so i don't you know i'm not part of the technical team that uh deals with accessibility per se but um from my own knowledge we work with all the major screen readers do you have a specific question about a specific screen reader or a specific concern because i could get you an answer around that if you have something more specific yeah i do know that hypothesis is um web accessibility compliant to mm -hmm. I think at least AA standards, which includes um, being able to use it with screen readers um, and also somewhat relatedly in terms of accessibility, um, you can also operate it entirely from the keyboard. So um, yeah, I, I believe that that is sort of built in. Thank you for adding that, LJ, thank you. Um, I'm just seeing here if we've got I think that's just more of a comment on the general accessibility concern most of the students using. Okay. If you, um, because I know you're under anonymous, if you wanted to reach out, I can pop my email in a chat, um, if, or you can reach out to our support team who might be able to better assist with specific questions around accessibility. Why don't I pop their email in the chat and then you could reach out to them with some specifics. Okay. Well, I would just like to say thank you to Jennifer and LJ for such a great presentation. It's an awesome way to wrap up our first day of the conference. I know it's not always easy to have the last spot of the day, but you guys are super, um, it was super engaging. And I appreciate all the time and effort you put in to uh, presenting for us today. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you everyone else for attending. And hopefully we will see many of you back tomorrow. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, LJ. Yeah, thank you, everyone.